At the end of my first year teaching, some of you know I was a middle school teacher for a bit. So at the end of my first year teaching, on the last day I had, before I had to apply, before I had to renew my contract for the next year, I sat before my principal in her little office, decor decorated with Pier 1 Imports <laughs> goods. I, I sat in there, and I looked her in the eye, and I said, I'm sorry, but I'm not able to return next year. I'm not able to renew my contract for next year. And the reason was not because the kids were tough. It was not because the pay was bad. And it was not because the job was physically, spiritually, and emotionally exhausting. <laughs> those weren't, that wasn't the reasons. Um, despite all those things, uh, my plan was still to come back. My plan had always been, since you know the second half of the year, I'm going to be returning next year because I learned a lot after the first year. The first year teaching is always the worst. <laughs> Because you enter in and you're like, I don't care what my teachers say. I'm going to be a friend to these kids from day one. <laughs> like, I'm going to be their best friend. They can do whatever they want. <laughs> and then you spend the rest of the year trying to recover. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, but I learned a lot over the past year um, to the point where I was ready to come back again. And also, I had met, been dating this really, really nice girl named Sarah Watling, now Sarah DeCan. Um, and so I kind of wanted to stick around. You know what I mean? But I didn't. So it wasn't for any of those reasons. The reason that I left, the reason that I sat before my principal that day was because five days earlier, the Lord spoke to me and told me, leave your job. Now is the time for you to start preparing for ministry. Now is the time to enter the ministry. So before that time, like, I had kind of like a general call. I kind of felt like, is the God calling me to enter ministry? I'm not really sure. But it was at a prayer gathering five days before that, the Lord spoke to me strongly and said, now is the time. Like, quit your job. Go ahead. and Start, start going to seminary. Start training to become a minister. And can I tell you, how I must have looked to my principal to sit before her on that day. Five, like the, this is the last day I had. Like it was the last possible moment I could have told her, yeah, actually I'm not coming back next year. You know how I looked to her that day? Foolish. Totally foolish. I was leaving a decent job. Like I, I made fun of the pay, but the pay actually wasn't bad, right? I had a salary schedule and everything, you know? Uh, and I'm, I'm going to pursue this thing, something as ambiguous as ministry. Like, what does that even mean? Okay, what do you mean by ministry? I'm not really sure yet. <laughs> not really sure. I'm not really positive. I didn't have a plan. My plan was to quit my job and I guess start looking for schools. But I hadn't had one picked at all. And so to her, to my principal, I looked like, like I was an idiot. Like, why would you do this? This doesn't make any sense by the world's standards. All I knew was that God spoke to me, and I needed to obey. All that other stuff, the things I hoped for, my dreams, where God was leading me, those would come later. And they did. They did that hope I did receive. And so today, we're looking at a similar story in the Bible, the story of Joseph, uh, Jesus' earthly father, you know, the carpenter, and how his obedience despite what he may have looked like to other people, because other people, they must have thought he looked foolish for the things that he did. His obedience brought hope to himself, to those around him, and to us. 2,000 years later, his obedience brought hope. So turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Matthew 1, verse 18. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man. He's a good guy. And he did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. So when... 
when Joseph found out, initially, like his first response is, well, I guess I got to divorce her. Because back in those days, an engagement, you were basically married already. It was a covenant agreement. So he had in this covenant agreement to marry, and then he finds out one day, well, she's pregnant, and we haven't done anything. So what, what conclusion could he draw, right? She must have been with another man. And, I mean, I ask you guys, like, what would you have done if you found out that your, your fiancé was pregnant before you came together? I would have probably done the same, like, start, start thinking, like, this is maybe not the person that I thought she was. And so he makes this plan to divorce him. He may have had, like, and yeah, by all, by all accounts, like, this was, this was a pretty wise plan. It was kind. He wasn't going to throw her out in the street and proclaim, you know, remember the story at the end of, in John, where it talks about the adulteress, the woman who's caught in adultery? They threw her out in the street. They wanted to stone her for committing adultery. He said, absolutely not. I want to divorce her quietly to not bring shame upon her name and so that she could potentially live a decent life. So he came up with this plan that was wise and kind by the world's standards. It was a good plan, but it wasn't God's plan. It wasn't God's plan. Let's, let's look at verse 20. The story continues. So as Joseph considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. And I love how it says he considered this. He didn't just like make the decision, this is where I'm going. He had a soft heart. You know this was a difficult decision. He was, he was in turmoil over this, in torment. What am I supposed to do? I feel like I have to do this, but what about Mary? He was a righteous man. He was a good man. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus. The name Jesus means uh, the Lord saves, for he will save his people from their sins. For he will save these people from their sins. So Joseph receives a revelation from God. Even after his initial plan, he receives a revelation from God that goes against all earthly wisdom, all earthly intelligence, and any advice he might have received from his friends, his family, spiritual leaders. But like, that is dumb. <laughs> like, don't marry the pregnant girl. That doesn't even make sense. Don't do that. That's a, that's a way to ruin your life. Right? To the world, this was Foolish. Foolishness. Just like it was when I was leaving my job, when I sat before my principal. Sometimes God asks us to do, do, to do things, to obey him, and to the world they seem foolish, absolutely dumb. For example, let's say the Lord asked you to leave your job because they ask you to work on Sundays. They ask you to work when you're supposed to be in church. I know one of you this week actually did leave their job because they asked them to work on Sundays. That's obeying the Lord. But to the world, that's foolishness. You got to look after yourself. Look after number one, right? Do anything you can to get ahead. The world says these things are foolish. But here's the deal. God has chosen the foolish things in this world to shame the wise. He has chosen the weak things in this world to shame the strong so that no one can stand before God and boast of their own wisdom and boast of their own strength, boast of their own ability, because before God, all falls to pieces. Every knee will bow. Every heart will praise, every tongue will confess, for he is the Lord, and he is control, and he has our best in store for us. So it doesn't matter what initial plans we might have had. It doesn't matter how good they are, how wise they are. By the world's standards, before God's standard and his best plan for us, they amount to nothing. It doesn't matter how smart your plan was. If you're disobedient to God, it's the worst plan it's the worst plan. 
So despite what others would think, Joseph obeys God. He doesn't listen to the world, he doesn't listen to his friends, doesn't listen to his family, doesn't listen to his religious leaders. He obeys God. And let me say something. Joseph didn't, you know, Mary, Mary, the angel Gabriel, physically stood in front of her and told her, you're going to be, have a child. That didn't happen to Joseph. He had a dream about an angel who told him, this is much closer to our experience, right? Not met, raise your hand if you met with an angel sometime in your life and knew about it. We got two people. I want to talk to you later. I believe you. I just want to hear about this. I want to hear the story, right? It doesn't happen to a lot of us. What we do get is we get dreams, we get visions. The still small voice in our head talks to us and we recognize this is God. Some people hear God audibly, but we don't often hear it see a visible angel in all of its, his glory, right? But Joseph still obeyed this word from the Lord. He takes Mary as his wife despite how it looks to his friends and his family. You know. It doesn't matter how well they, try, they tried to hide it. I don't even think they did try to hide it. They got some side looks from their family and friends. Mm-hmm. There's Joseph and there's Mary. You know, she was pregnant when he married her. Something's going on there. And Joseph was in Bethlehem. Mm-hmm. Timeline doesn't add up, guys. I don't know. <laughs> he refuses to sleep with her until after the baby was born. He wasn't asked to do that. He went above and beyond there. So there will be no doubt this is the child of the promise. This is the chosen Messiah who was prophesied, who was, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Man, what a guy. You all know how hard that must have been. And he names him Jesus, the Lord saves, submitting to the Lord's plan for his life. When you named a child in the, in, the, in the Bible, it was like a prophecy over their life. The Lord saves. I'm submitting to the Lord's plan for him. I wanted, you know, my first son, I kind of wanted him to be a carpenter. All right, no, I'm going to submit to the Lord's plan. He's going to be the savior of the world. Maybe not the hardest decision. I don't know. But <laughs> anyway, he did. And Joseph's obedience to God, his obedience produced hope. Joseph's obedience produced hope. Hope for us. Jesus, the Lord saves. He would save us from our sins. The same sins that have been plaguing us, that still plague us for thousands of years, that tear families apart, that ruin friendships, destroy marriages, and, and wrecked our covenant with God wrecked our relationship with God. All the way back into the beginning when Adam and Eve first sinned, it broke relationship with God. Jesus, this child, would redeem it all. He would bring those relationships back together between us and those around us and between us and the Lord. This child would restore them all. And if that's not hope, I don't know what is. That is the greatest hope we could receive, and it was because Joseph was obedient. And Joseph's obedience didn't just bring hope to us 2,000 years in the future. It brought hope to Mary. It brought hope to Jesus right then, right within those years. Can you imagine what would have happened to Mary if Joseph ignored the angel? She might have been thrown out in the street. She probably would have gotten kicked out of her home and labeled an adulteress. What about Jesus? Jesus would have grown up without an earthly father. We know that doesn't work out very well. We can do the best we can, but God's plan has always been for a child to be raised by both parents. Joseph's obedience produced hope. And he protected that hope fiercely, fiercely. Because after Jesus was born, his life was immediately in danger, immediately. Jesus, the Son of God, the King of the Jews, could not be hidden. He could not be kept a secret. There were too many signs, too many prophecies fulfilled in his birth. You read the book of Matthew, which is where this, this story is. So Matthew, 
Matthew was a tax collector, worked for the IRS, which means he was detail oriented. <laughs> and if you read the book of Matthew, he details 33 prophecies. Old Testament prophecies about what the Messiah would be like, where he would come from, where he would be born, where he would spend the first few years of his life. Matthew lists all of them and explains how they were fulfilled in the birth and life of Jesus. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, all people who deal with taxes. <laughs> Thanks, Carl. <laughs> yeah. There were too many prophecies, too many signs fulfilled in his birth. So King Herod, who was at that time the actual king of the Jews, he was the king of the Jews. He hears about Jesus' birth from the wise men. Remember them? You know, they wear like turbans and like long flowy purple cloaks and they have like treasure chests and they walk, these three kings of, you know. Probably one of the harder costumes to pull off for the children's pageant. The wise men stand before King Herod because they've been following a star, right? They follow a star from the east, and it crosses over Jerusalem. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, five miles south of Jerusalem. It crosses over Jerusalem. So they're like, oh, well, the king of the Jews must, been, must be in Jerusalem. So they stop by King Herod's palace, and they stand before him and say, hey, where is he? King Herod's like, where's who? You know, the, the new king of the Jews, where is he? I am the king of the Jews. What are you talking about? No, 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 no. We saw a star. We've been following it for like two years. And it says the king of the Jews is going to be right here. He's new, probably was born a couple years ago. The king of the Jews was Herod's title. And so I think we all can look upon this moment, the wise men standing before the King Herod, and tell them all, guys, read the room. Where's the newborn king of the Jews? Where is he? No, it's not you. No, -uh, that's not, it's not you. It's someone else. He was born two years ago. Where is he? Guys, come on. So Herod is immediately threatened by this. It says, newborn king of the Jews, where is he? And then he like, summons all of his, all of his prophets, all of his, all of his scribes and stuff. Where is the king of the Jews supposed to be born? Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? Oh, just five miles south in Bethlehem. And so what he plans to do, he like sets about this nefarious plot He's to protect himself. And he says, all right, every boy under two years old living in and around Bethlehem, dead. We're going to kill them all. And this was not like, this was, this was normal for King Herod. The Herods were like known for being just murderous snakes. This same King Herod, he had killed multiple of his own children so they wouldn't take his position as king over the Jews. So when he heard there's a newborn king of the Jews in Bethlehem, easy decision for him. Okay, just kill all the babies. This horrendous act against everyone, but also against the Lord. And so here's what happens. Matthew 2, verse 13. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Love it. Get up. Flee to Egypt with the child and his mother. Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child and kill him. He gives them a prophecy. This is what is going to happen. Get up and leave now. And so that night, that very night, remember, it had been in a dream which means he woke up at 2 in the morning, and then that very night, Joseph left for Egypt with the baby and its mother. And they stayed there until Herod's death, which happened, we don't know exactly when, but five to six, maybe 10 years later, they stayed in a new place that was not their home, all because Joseph had a dream from an angel saying, go. And he just went. Can you imagine that? Like in your own life, imagine you have a dream, and that dream says an atomic bomb is going to fall on Seattle tomorrow. You need to get to California tonight. You need to just go. Take your family and leave. Can you imagine how hard that would be? How difficult it would be to just pick up all your stuff and just go. 
just go and leave. I have a wife and two kids, and it takes us like three hours to go to Costco. <laughs> so to leave the night, the, that night to another country with a backpack and a donkey maybe, that would have been so hard. Do you know what kind of faith that would have ta taken? Tremendous faith. Trusting and obeying the Lord. And we got to remember, you know, we focus on Mary a lot during these times. You know, she was specially chosen from God to basically raise the Son of God, raise Jesus. But he didn't just choose Mary. God chose Joseph, too. Yeah. Joseph was a good guy. <laughs> Joseph was awesome. Oh, man. Joseph obeyed God, and his obedience protected Mary and protected the Savior of our world. He kept the hope alive. Because shortly after they left, Herod did declare every single boy under two years old would be slaughtered. And they were. But Jesus was spared because of Joseph's obedience. He just went and left. He just did it. And so we see not only does obedience to God produce hope, it also protects it. Obedience to God produces and protects hope. It keeps the hope alive. Can you imagine what would have happened if Joseph just like woke up from his dream? Said, oh, that was weird. Must, <laughs> must have been the baklava I ate. I don't know. Is that culturally appropriate? I don't know. <laughs> it's dicey. There's pistachios somewhere. I don't know. Um, Jesus might have been killed. You know, the Bible doesn't say. The Lord might have raised up someone else to save Jesus. But we don't know that. Hope would, might have been lost that day. Hope might have been lost that night. What would have happened if I had just sat before my principal in that office and given in to the pressure, if I just chickened out? Because she could be intimidating when she wanted, when she wanted to be. And she had a very good, she had a very, you know, she's one of those, like, very strict, but she's very, like, convincing people. Are you really sure you want to do this? Because A, B, and C, how did she come up with a plan that fast? Like, how am I going to keep this kid? Like, how am I going to keep him in, in my employ for longer? Can you imagine if I had given in then? I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't have gone to seminary. I wouldn't have, like, the amount of even like, the Lord's guidance that led me to this church that went into that was tremendous in my own life. This was the only place I could have gone. And if I had chickened out in that moment, I wouldn't be here. I don't know what I'd be doing. I'd probably be substitute teaching. Oh, no. <laughs> what a nightmare. <laughs> By obeying God, not man, we protect hope. We protect it. And we know that obedience, it's not just like a once-in-a-lifetime moment, right? It's not just, okay, I obeyed God once. All right, I'm good for the rest of my life. Obedience is a lifestyle. That's what we see with Joseph. I gave you two examples of Joseph receiving a dream from the Lord, and then he just goes up and does it. It happens to him four times. In short order, and he never hesitates a single time because his obedience to the Lord, it wasn't just one and done. It was I spend my life in obedience to the Lord knowing that his plans for me, his will for me is perfect and is better than anything I could come up for on my own. And that's what God is calling all of us to do today to live our lives in obedience to him and to his word and his plans for us because they're better than anything we got. They're better than anything I've got. They're better than anything any of you got. They're better. Following the Lord, submitting your life to him, and being willing to let go of the things that you think are important, the things that you think are essential to your living, Mary and Joseph, their reputation, that was important to them. 
Back in the Middle East, back in those days, reputation was everything. And yet they laid it all on the line to be a part of God's plan. And so my question to you guys today is, are you willing to do the same? Are you willing to lay it all on the line, your reputation, your finances, your living situation, where you go to church? Are you willing to lay it all on the line for the sake of obeying God and submitting to his plan for your life? There are many of you who right now, in this moment, you feel hopeless. You feel like for the past months, years, maybe even decades, nothing has gone right. You feel trapped. You feel stuck in a job, in a relationship, in anything. You feel stuck, just trapped. There is no hope. I don't even know how I'm going to get through tomorrow. You may have even considered, like, why is this life even worth living anymore? What is the point? Because you've lost all hope. May I suggest to you today, take a step of faith. Make an action of obedience. Ask the Lord, these, this question, and it's risky. I've told you this before. This is a risky question to ask the Lord, and it is, what do you want me to do? With my life, with my situation, you can be as specific or as broad as you want, but what do you want me to do, Lord, and have enough patience and have enough courage to sit and listen and wait? Because it's an action of submitting your life before the throne of God. It's saying, I am taking my life and I am laying it upon the altar before you, God, as a sacrifice. It's like you're killing yourself. You're killing your, like, who you want to be. You're killing your hopes, your dreams, and choosing God instead, knowing and having faith and trust that his are better than yours. And they will end you, his plans, his will for you will end you up in such a better place than you ever anticipated. I look at my, where, where my journey has led me to this church. I would have never anticipated being a youth pastor. I would have never anticipated being an associate pastor of, under a person like Pastor Garen. Guys, the Lord has given me such hope and has placed me in a place that is so absolutely perfect for me where, honestly, like, I wanted to be in a place where I could be a blessing to other people, where I could serve other people. But you are a blessing to me. You are a blessing to my family. And you are a blessing to the people of Auburn. When I look at what we did yesterday and last week, I am so encouraged that we are a church that loves people so much and loves God so much to submit to him and give up our lives for him. And that kind of hope would not have existed if we had just gone by our own our own earthly wiles, our own earthly wisdom, and just said, you know, what, what works in that book? What works in this podcast I watched? No, we prayed. We sought the Lord. What do we want to do? And the Lord gave us his wisdom, gave us his challenge, gave us his word for the people of Auburn, and it blessed people. And I believe we're going to see fruit from it. And that's the kind of life I want our church to live, and that's the kind of life that I want you guys to live too to be able to take your own life, submit your own hopes, submit what you want for yourself, and say, God, what do you want for me? I promise you it will be 10, 15, 50 times greater than you could have ever imagined for yourself to lay your life upon the altar of God and say, give me what you got, Lord. I will do it. Here I am. Send me your obedience will produce hope for you, for your family, 
for Auburn, for the world. But you need to take a step. So I'm going to ask you all, why don't you stand up right now? And we're just going to take a couple moments. Every head bowed, every eye closed. And I want you to repeat after me. Jesus, Jesus. what do you want me to do? Lord, I put my life on your altar and say, show me what your plan is for my life. Show it to me, Lord. And now just sit here. Oh, I'm sorry. Now, you, that's the end of the prayer. <laughs> <laughs> and now, and now, and now, just sit here in this moment and just wait. What does the Lord want for you? Maybe it's uh, to take a step out and start a new ministry. Maybe it's, maybe it is to begin tithing where you haven't before. Maybe it's to just trust Him more to love more freely without restraint to forgive that person you've held a grudge against for years we worship you Lord we submit to you Jesus and your plans for our lives bless you Lord Jesus, I pray for every single person in this room and online, and I pray that you would reveal to them your will for their lives right now and in the days, weeks to come, Jesus. Walk this road with them. Show them what to do and show them how they fit into your plan for salvation, for the redemption of this world. Show them, Jesus. And when they know, give them the courage to act in obedience knowing that their obedience produces hope and their obedience protects hope too. In Jesus' name, amen. And there's one more question I want to ask you guys. And that is, maybe your obedience today is to come before Jesus or maybe you've been running from him for a, for a long time to stand before him, to stand before the foot of your maker and say, Jesus, will you be my savior? I want to be a Christian. Is there anyone in here, every head bowed, every eye closed, is there anyone in here, would you raise your hand if you want to be a Christian today, you want to follow Jesus for the first time, or maybe you want to rededicate your life to him, would you raise your hand? In person or online, online the Lord sees you too. Well, we're going to join in a prayer together. All of us together, all Christians, anyone or anyone who wants to join the family of God, let's all pray. Repeat after me. Jesus, Jesus I, know I'm a I know I'm a sinner. I've messed up. I've messed up. But, I stand you. but I stand before you. And I turn to you. And I, turn to you. I turn away from my sins. I ask you to forgive me of them. Be my savior. Be my master. And lead me. And Jesus, I will follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And... If you prayed that prayer, if you acted out in obedience, there is no greater hope that has just entered into your life than right now, right at this moment. Your life is forever changed when you choose to follow Jesus and make him your Lord and Savior. 
God bless you guys. I love you. Great work, Pastor Christian. I, I don't know if I've ever really connected obedience and hope before, but I love that. A lifestyle of hope produces and protects, protects obedience. It's so great. I, 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 I want that. You want that for you? Yes. It, uh, Pastor Christian just led you in a prayer uh, for some of you to put your faith in Jesus for the first time. If you did that today, would you let us know? So on the back of the Connect card, there's a little box to check. Just check that. Give me enough info on the front of the card that, that uh, I, I know who, who did it so that we can uh, just pray for you and encourage you in your newfound faith online. You can text use, use our, using our phone number, our text number, 97000. Text the word greet means I'm, I'm new to church. Text the word restart means I just prayed with Pastor Christian. I've restarted my life. Ushers, are you coming? Looking for you? Yep. And they'll collect connect cards. I see them in the in the two side aisles. So if you filled out a connect card, uh, maybe you put a prayer request on it or you're connecting for the first time, you can hand it to an usher or they'll take it for you. Uh, if you're watching online, be sure and subscribe or like so that other people can, can help find this life-giving message of Jesus. And I think that's about it today. We'll see you next Sunday. God bless you. Thanks for being here.